Hi, this is Ron Huxley, and I want to talk to you a little bit about my tri-unity model of setting yourself free from anxiety. I call it tri-unity because there are three main components that will make up who we are, our human nature. And it's within these dimensions or domains of who we are that we will find our freedom. We want balance to occur within all three of these things, and there is a specific order or a hierarchy that will enable us to have optimal health in all areas, in particular dealing and overcoming, dealing with anxiety and overcoming those fears in our life. What I want to talk to you about is how these things come, what each of these things are, and then also how these things are important to come in the correct order and why. So at the top of the hierarchy, we have our spirit. And so just a little dis disclaimer here. I do have a faith-based perspective from a Judeo-Christian viewpoint, and that's my basis for this. Uh, you can accept what you want and take away what you want. You will find good information regardless of what your beliefs might be. But I just want to let you know that if you're able to use all of what I'm saying, you will find the greatest amount of breakthrough in your life. Many of my clients that I work with, they don't have a faith, they don't believe in God, they don't have a spirituality. And as a result of that, they are only able to achieve a certain level of breakthrough. I want you to be able to achieve a maximum level of breakthrough. So there is a spiritual element to this, but again, you can take away what you want and leave behind what you don't. That's fine. So at the top of the hierarchy, again, we have the spirit, and this is the area which is a part of our life. This is the spark that comes into us when we are first born. And in Psalms 139.14, it says there that God declares that when a spark of life occurred in us, at the moment of conception, that he saw us as beautifully and wonderfully made. At that moment, he saw the very identity, the purpose, and the destiny that was on each of our lives. Now, because we live in a world that is not perfect, because we're in it, a lot of our identity and our destiny does not get fulfilled. And that creates a lot of problems in our life, including anxiety. There are many other things that we can discuss, but specifically we were talking about how it comes up in terms of fears and anxiety. Fortunately, God says in 2 Timothy that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It's a sound mind that had a sense of peace. This peace might also be described as a sense of ease in life, that you feel comfortable in your own skin, that you're not afraid to go into social situations, that you're able to speak in front of other people with confidence, that you know who you are and whose you are, that you have a sense of identity that can't be rattled or offended by other people. You're not re easily rejected. You're not humiliated by other people. You don't have a lot of irrational fears and thoughts. You are not controlled by a rumination of a constant cycling of thoughts in your mind about redoing things over and over and over again. These are normal things that you can control if you have a sense of ease or peace in your life. And that occurs through this divine order or this uh, hierarchy of order, this triune model. When you do not have ease, you have dis-ease. And that occurs in your spirit, in your mind, and in your body. So the spirit is essential for us to connect and to control the mind and the body. The role of this order is for the spirit, through a connection with a higher power or the Holy Spirit, you then are able to gain a sense of that original identity about who you were when you were born. So you rediscover this. You do this by having a perspective of yourself in the world and of other people out of the world that is based on God's view of them. Because when we look at people through our mind and through our uh, bodies, and how we see them is one of fear and terror and humiliation and anger and hostility. And this is where a lot of our relationship issues break down and we have a spirit of fear that controls us. But when we're able to have a godly perspective on things, and have an intimate relationship with God, we're then able to have make sense of who we are, and we're not easily offended, and we're not controlled by fear. 
Now, another verse of the Bible says that um, he has not given, that we are not controlled, but he's given us perfect love casts out all fear, excuse me. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear is about punishment. See, we often live in a very punitive light world that focus on rewards and conditional, conditional behavior. You're loved conditionally. You have to perform some certain expectation. One of the hallmarks of anxiety is perfectionism. And so one of us put ourselves to a certain order. We have certain beliefs and irrational thoughts that we will use to describe what would be um, a, a good person, a good husband, a good wife, a good dad, a good son, a good mom, a good employee, a good boss. And we put these levels of standards and our worth and our value, or our identity comes from meeting those standards. Sadly, we are always going to disappoint one another, disappoint ourselves, because there's always someone brighter, handsomer, smarter, faster, uh, bigger, better performers, um, more wealthy, and there are always people who are going to be better at things. And one of the dangers of anxiety when it comes to our minds is that we have these thoughts that by comparing ourselves to other people, we compare ourselves to other moms or other dads or other employees, and we always find someone that makes us come up short. So again, the divine order for health versus dis-ease is to have a sense of knowing who we are in relationship to God. Once we have done that, that spirit then defines how we should think about ourselves and other people. And in our minds, then we can control our body. It's our job of our minds to make sense uh, and, and manage our bodies and our behaviors and our choices. Now, what happens if you don't have this order correct? Well, oftentimes what happens for us is that we get this reversed and our bodies become dominant over our minds. And then we have addictions and then we have anxiety and we have fears and we have depression. We have a lot of issues that control us physiologically based on ability just to feel good. So much of our, because of traumas, because of issues that have occurred in our life, because we're just human with a propensity for, for making bad choices and dealing with those consequences or the consequences of other people have done towards us, that then places us in a place of putting the body first so that we can avoid pain and try to grasp pleasure. So much of dealing with anxiety is really about managing pain. We talk a lot about managing self, but when we talk about managing self, we're really talking about how we manage pain. And we do that through having a divine order, again, of knowing our identity, being able to make choices about appropriate beliefs based on truth, not lies. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Which then controls how we operate in our body and our behaviors. See, our love flows downhill. The love that we experience from each other and from God defines our sense of self, which then determines our choices. If we don't have that love or we feel it's conditional, then the order is upset and we are then operating from, and the body is ruling us, and the body is a taskmaster. It is a cruel master. It will push you to achieve, to do things that you don't want to do that is detrimental and damaging to your life. And it's the reason so many of us sabotage our relationships, our work environments, our jobs, because our body is ruling us. I won't go into more too many detail because I want to get more specific in terms of the neurology of it. And I'll, I'll do that as well. What happens when our body, though, is controlling our minds, it is then determining our choices. And then when we determine our choices, we are no longer experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. We're no longer in connection to our identity that we are given at that moment of uh, conception of life, that spark of life. We have no sense of who we are in community. We have no sense of who we are in terms of the universe. However you want to phrase it, we no longer know who we are in this situation, and we are controlled by our impulses and our everything that would distract us. When we put this in the right, correct order, then we can then focus in on the mind. And the mind is a corporation of both our thoughts and our feelings 
and our will, our will to choose, our will to decide. Now, many people think that our will is specifically about stubbornness, like a, he's a strong, it's a strong-willed child, or he's very willful. And this comes out in a sense of pride and stubborn behavior or selfish behavior. You see a lot of people who are, again, driven by the body, out of fear, out of anxiety. That then causes us to behave in certain ways that makes us resistant to other people, and it damages our relationships. It isolates us and disconnects us from the world. If we are in divine order, we are in connections with other people and with ourself. If we are in a place of disconnection, we are not in order. So our will is about making choices that are bring ease and peace into our life, not about creating dis-ease through imbalance and not about being stubbornness. Our thoughts are very important, and most of mental health, when it comes to dealing with anxiety, wants to focus in on this area of our thoughts. And it is very true that our thoughts do determine a lot of our emotions and our behaviors. And in a very popular model for dealing with anxiety or any mental disorder for that matter is cognitive behavioral therapy. And basically it has three points that we kind of can frame in terms of a triangle. And we have thoughts at the top part. And these are the things that we're thinking. So if someone comes to me and they say to, for example, I had a couple the other evening and they were fighting. Not unfamiliar for couples to fight, but they are fighting because of a text message. And one person misinterpreted what the other person was sending to them about their children that they are co parenting. And the person that was sitting there thought the other person was wanting to reconcile somehow through this text. And the other per and I read the text, it didn't say that at all, but because this person thought that that's what this was about, they had this whole agenda and behavioral reactions and emotional reactions based on what they believe to be true. And that then creates a sense, that creates a sense of behaviors and certain consequences in our life. And we might put in here, maybe make this emotional consequences. So our thoughts do govern a lot of how we feel, in particular our anxiety. But unfortunately, most cognitive behavioral therapies don't incorporate um, this higher order of the spirit and many of them are not really connecting to what's coming out in terms of neuroscience there's so much information on neuroscience and attachment research that is so important and i give you numerous videos or well, numerous videos three or four videos that you can use to help you regulate your body because where the mind and the body connect is the area of the brain and the nervous system so one of the models that I incorporate in this triunity model of freedom from anxiety is to utilize a calming down effect. Because when we believe something in a certain way, we then have certain behavioral and emotional reactivities to it. But what happens if our brain and our mind are telling us that we're in danger? We're going to adopt a survival mechanism and we're going to be in constant fight or flight reactivity. That's the part of our brain, the physical brain, uh, called the limbic system, and specifically the amygdala, which is an almond-shaped uh, organ in the middle, very middle of your brain. It's kind of behind your nose, in the middle of your head. And this thing is designed to protect you from harm. So for many of us have gone through difficult circumstances, traumatic situations, and this has caused our amygdala and our limbic system of the brain to be hyper vigilant to problems that might look like or represent areas that we have been traumatized or hurt in the past. As a result of this hurt, we then begin to adopt a certain uh, framework in terms of our mind, which I call lies. And they're specifically called lies because they're not true. They're lies that we believe about ourselves and our situation that are designed by the mind and specifically through organs in the limbic system in the brain that protect us. 
but it's trickiness because oftentimes we will filter what comes into the world through our senses, part of the area of the, of the brain of, and the body, and we will misinterpret those that information coming in, and we will believe something about ourselves, and that belief over time becomes like a stronghold in our life that causes us to fear public speaking. We can't ask someone out on a date. We are unable to go into public places. We can't go wash our hands into a public restroom. We won't drink milk unless we check the expiration date. We have so many different areas of anxiety that affects us in life, or we stay up all night worrying and ruminating on a topic, all because of lies that we're believing based on traumatic experiences that we've had in our lives in the past, or difficult circumstances in the past, and our mind and our brain are convincing us that they are true, but they're not. So a lot of cognitive therapies are trying to confront and disprove the lies. And so I will have a handout that you can use, which will specifically look at some of the anxiety lies that we believe and some ways that you can confront them and control them. For right now, again, we want to stick with what this triune model. So let's move down into the, the body. And the body includes everything within our organs, our muscles, our circulation, our nervous system, our, everything that incorporates our physical matter. Now, we are beautifully designed. Again, it goes back to that Psalms 139.14. We are beautifully and wonderfully made. And it involves our identity. It involves our thought processes. Our mind our ama is an amazing thing. We don't even have a ounce of understanding all that's going on in our mind and we have an amazing brain as well there's nothing like it like any other species on the planet that we have an ability to think amazing thoughts do incredible creative activities to come up with unbelievable ideas that are transformative and this is all because of this organ called the brain and the nervous system that incorporates it so the brain itself is in, has three levels, ironically. And we have a brain stem, and the brain stem's design is to control the non-voluntary areas of our body, like heart rate and lungs uh, operating and um, receiving senses into our body and digestion and all of those things that might go on. And it's important that we don't think about those. Why it's non-voluntary? Because we go to sleep at night, you know, we would shut down and we would die. And that's not what we're wanting. So this part runs continuously throughout our lives. And that's really an important concept, which I'll get to come back to, the ability to be constantly on and what that's supposed to look like. So this brainstem is a mediator between the higher order areas of the brain and the, the body and specifically the nervous system. So we have a spinal cord and we have a central nervous system that goes down through our spinal cord and then we have nerve endings that go throughout our entire body. Now the job of these nerve endings are to take information in what's going on with our internal organs and our different areas of our body. If we get an itch someplace, if we are cut or hurt someplace, if there's a stomach ache or a heart problem, our nervous system registers this and sends it to the brain for processing for things that we need to do to take care of ourselves. If then we are also, or we're also getting information from the outside world through our senses. And we have five senses that we recognize. We have sight, we have sound, we have smell, we have taste, and we have touch. Our skin is basically one very large um, sensory organ, and we get a lot of information from that. When we are um, in an anxious state of mind, that gets disrupted. And much of our sensory system becomes either sensory defensive or sensory seeking. Because when we are in a dis-ease, state of mind, we have a disease within our body, meaning actual heart attack issues within our body, stomach aches, ulcers, back pain, those kind of things. But also we have a dis-ease in terms of our ability to process information that goes back into our mind. And we will then become people who will have to touch everything because we can't get enough information or we are feeling like the world is hostile and there's too much sensory input. A lot of 
Anxiety disorders are really based on being sensory defensive, with just too much stimulation coming into our body and we can't process it because we're not, again, in the right type of order of balance within our body and within our mind and within our spirit. And we don't have the right control. Our body's controlling things and so our mind's not able to process it and our spirit's not able to identify it and label it. So along with our, in our nervous system in terms of taking in senses, we also have an autonomic nervous system. And this is involved with what's called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic is the gas pedal, parasympathetic is the brake. We need both of these, again, to achieve balance within our body. If we are pushing on one more than the other, there are problems in our world. I have a video on children and the window of tolerance. I encourage you to watch that. That's true for adults as well as children, but it talks specifically about how to get a balance between these two areas. Now, for our purposes here, what we want to look at is that if we are pushing on the sympathetic or gas, there is a sense of feeling alive, right? It's like stepping on a gas in a hot rod and you are feeling alive cruising down the road. But you're also engaged in some very risky behaviors and you can come to a crash if you're not careful because of the speed in which you are going. The same thing happens to our physical bodies and to our mind. We are not designed to have a gas pedal that's constantly on. It overwhelms our brain and it disrupts our ability to think and it sends a signal to that amygdala that says we are in danger uh, all the time and the, it's a vicious loop because as we begin to perceive we're in danger, we send false signals back out that we're in danger and then our body keeps hitting the gas pedal trying to engage in what's called a fight or flight reactivity. So this fight or flight reaction causes us to run from problems, avoid problems. Most of us are really avoiding pain. One way of looking at anxiety is that we're avoiding a fear. It's a fear of the fear. It's not even a fear that's to happen. You're anxious about something that's going to happen. Like you have to ask someone on a date and just the thought of it scares you. Or you're going to go speak in a meeting at work and just the thought of it occurring. It hasn't even happened yet. It's in the future, which means it hasn't even occurred. So, But yet we're already worried about it. And so it creates a disruption our dis-ease again within our thought process and within our body and we're in a constant play a vicious cycle of um, fight or flight reactivity so and again on a physical level what this does for us and creates disease is that when that gas pedal is on it is constantly shooting cortisol and stress hormones throughout the body and that can actually break down the organs I mean, we need an optimal level of it so we can be highly efficient and productive during the day and deal with problems and be task-oriented and get stuff done and feel alive. We like that feeling uh, to some degree. But again, if it's pushed too far, it starts to actually break down the organs in the body, creates disruptions of thought so you can't think during the day, which is a lot of reasons children, for example, can't learn well at school and do poorly in school because they're in a constant state of disruption from this fight or flight reactivity. And that um, cortisol that's secreted, it overextends the adrenal glands. And then when the adrenal glands start breaking down, we engage in this sense of fatigue. We have uh, fatigue which can result in depression and will create even greater sense of fear and anxiety. And so it just goes on and on in this way. And you can see the the problems that occur when there's too much gas pedal. You can also have problems when you have too much brake pedal. And you put the brake pedal, you're constantly in shutdown mode. And what happens in a lot of like uh, relationships with men and women is that the man will shut down because the woman continues to come at him trying to get needs in the relationship that he's not giving her. And so she pushes on the gas pedal, he pushes on the brake pedal, and then they're in this vicious cycle once again, and there's just an emotional shutting down. And many of us can get into emotional shutting down. So we can go into hiding. We don't go out into public places. We won't engage in activities. We won't um, do things that scare us and create anxiety in us to try to preserve ourselves and protect ourselves based on messages. And that creates a shutdown effect. It's a flight and it's a over parasympathetic response to a situation. So there are good ways to use this parasympathetic and sympathetic system and I give a lot of really good information in some videos called the Karate Chop and the Safe Place and the Butterfly Hug and some other things that resources that you will have 
that will help you mediate in the right order between your mind and your body so that your mind is controlling your brain and body and putting that into balance by basically calming down those areas of the mind, the thoughts, and the brain that are overactive. So, the triune model of the brain. What we want to do is we want to then incorporate tools and techniques for dealing with anxiety that will incorporate all these areas. So again, we have some videos that will help for toning down and calming the body. We're going to have some um, tools that you can use on anxiety lies and automatic uh, negative thoughts and how to control those ants, ANTs, automatic negative, thought, negative thoughts, how to deal with uh, some cognitive behavioral ideas for managing your, your mind, how, and then spiritually speaking, how to start believing in the truth about who you are and your identity and disrupt these lies that continue to exist in your life. So I hope that's, that's a very small short-lived explanation of this model, but it is the basis for how we will approach the uh, freedom from anxiety. And you will have sections within these videos that will give you ideas both in the spirit and the mind and into the body. For now, what I want you to leave you with is just this idea that we want to have the correct order in our life where we are spiritually focused, we are um, mentally balanced, and that we have very calm and peaceful bodies. Hope that will help you as you go forward.